Uh, welcome to Bicom's Weekly Hadian Podcast, uh, episode 23. We are going to be talking about Hezbollah and its global uh, operations and also its activities in the Middle East. I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Levitt. Hi, Matthew, from Washington, D.C. Hi, how are you? Uh, Matthew is a fellow at the Washington Institute. He heads the program on counterterrorism and intelligence. He has years of experience at the U.S. Treasury, at the FBI, working on counterterrorism and and, uh, uh, finance of terrorist organizations. Um, He uh, also wrote in 2013 uh, a major work on Hezbollah called The uh, the Global Footprint of uh, Lebanon's Party of God. So, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, So really, I mean, in the UK, the government, we believe, is about to make the decision to end this fiction that there are two parts of Hezbollah, a military and a political wing. And they're finally going to prescribe, as it's described in uh, UK terrorism legislation, to ban the entire organization, both political and military wing. And they're going to... um, make it a criminal offence with quite serious penalties to uh, affiliate to the organisation, to support the organisation. So I guess my first question is, you know, in the UK and also in Europe, what is it that Hezbollah is doing as a sort of global terrorist organisation that poses a threat to Europe? Over the past few years, Hezbollah has uh, been engaged in more terrorist activity in Europe than it had been since uh, really the late 1980s, including two terrorist plots in Cyprus, uh, two, one, one in uh, Bulgaria, um, and several other uh, support functions um, throughout the continent. So, for example, the individual who rented the safe house in Cyprus where Hezbollah operatives were found and later convicted of storing chemical precursors to make explosives, a huge amount of explosives, was a Lebanese-French dual national who was working as an academic in France at the time that he spent uh, about 360,000 uh, euro to buy this house to use as a safe house. Uh, the ability to move throughout Europe, for example, as they're moving to and then away back out from the Burgas bulgaria operation. And then more generally, just a tremendous amount of uh, logistical support, weapons procurement, and illicit financial activity throughout the continent, including uh, a whole set of activity exposed by something called Operation Cedar, carried out by uh, U.S. and five or six different European countries, uh, law enforcement services, revealing Hezbollah money laundering and drug running Uh, throughout Europe and the arrest of 15 individuals, several of them senior Hezbollah operatives uh, in Paris for the first time, France France charging individuals with uh, narcotics trafficking specifically uh, to finance Hezbollah. The the drugs operation, um, is that just to finance the procurement of weapons and to finance operations or is something deeper than that? And how far does that go? So there's various different types of Hezbollah financing networks, and Hezbollah does have a variety of different functions from political activities and social welfare activities uh, to military and terrorist activities. The brilliance of the Hezbollah structure, however, is that there is no distinction between these wings, as Hezbollah officials themselves have said many, many times. So raising funds for any one aspect of the organization, at a minimum, uh, because the fungibility of money is uh, frees up funds for other activities. But what we've also found is that there are some dedicated financial um, networks, uh, illicit financial networks uh, set up by Hezbollah for the specific purpose of financing the group's uh, covert activities, its military and terrorist activities. And that's something we don't actually know what it's called. The U.S. Department of Justice describes it as Hezbollah's business affairs component. And it was this business affairs component that was investigated by U.S. and European law enforcement that led to Operation Cedar. And it's believed that this entity is not part of the politics of the charity, but specifically financing the most egregious, illicit, militant parts of the organization. And that we do see in various different parts uh, of the globe, including South America. And so in terms of their operational um, drive at the moment and what it is they're trying to do, do do you see evidence that Hezbollah is trying to increase um, 
terrorist attacks in Europe at the moment? I think that Hezbollah is ratcheting up pressure in a variety of different ways at a time when it and its primary sponsor and ally, Iran, are feeling under pressure. Under pressure because of the resumption of sanctions on Iran, ironically, largely because of its support for Hezbollah. Under pressure because of their activities in Syria in defense of the Assad regime, uh, and involvement in uh, what might be considered war crimes, targeting uh, Sunni civilians, uh, and because of their activities farther abroad still uh, in Iraq, in Yemen, etc. Uh, and they are ratcheting up pressure against uh, Western countries, uh, sometimes to do things in the near term and sometimes just to be prepared to do things. For example, two very senior Hezbollah terrorist operatives were arrested in the U.S. about a year and a half ago. Uh, they had conducted surveillance here in the United States. They would conducted surveillance and other operational activities in Panama and in Thailand, uh, including U.S. Uh, interests uh, abroad. It's not clear they intended to do something in the immediate, but you don't carry out pre-operation of surveillance just for the fun of it. Clearly, this was at least something they wanted to have as off-the-shelf planning. And so it does have uh, Western law enforcement and intelligence agencies um, in a higher state of alert regarding uh, Hezbollah and other Iranian proxies, even as the kind of primary terrorist threat that is occupying most of the counterterrorism space right now is the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda on the Sunni extremist side of the spectrum. Yeah, but but you, it's your opinion that Hezbollah has has the ability to to use weapons, to use explosives, and they've got the funds if they wanted to to carry out. They attacks. certainly have the capability and the funds. In many ways, they remain much uh, better trained uh, than ISIS, uh, Islamic State, um, or Al Qaeda ever will be because of their close ties to the Iranian intelligence services, which have significant capabilities. Uh, and because of particular um, interpersonal relationships as well. So consider uh, people like um, uh, Abdullah Safi Adin, who is Hezbollah's representative in Tehran, uh, an, a, a, an overt and a senior political role, who at the same time is deeply involved in this business affairs component, raising funds and procuring weapons for Hezbollah's military and terrorist activities. He was deeply involved in the procurement of sophisticated weapons for um, Iraqi Shia militias targeting coalition forces in Iraq during the war, in particular targeting U.S. and U.K. forces. You may recall that it was around this time that the U.K. expanded its partial designation of Hezbollah from just the terrorist wing to the terrorist and military wings of Hezbollah because Hezbollah was targeting uh, British soldiers in Iraq. Um, this is a perfect example of someone who has one foot in each world in the covert and overt worlds of Hezbollah. It's a perfect example of how the myth of distinct wings, legitimate, overt, political and social wing and a covert, illicit terrorist and military wing, uh, how, how uh, little truth there is to that myth. Mm. Well, it's interesting that point about the targeting of UK troops, because that was actually mentioned uh, in the media coverage when it was originally uh, um, the story first emerged that the government was going to ban all of Hezbollah. So what's the detail behind that, that the operatives working in Iraq around that time were specifically involved in, in, in trying, to, uh, trying to harm British soldiers? Yeah, it came that, down to um, operations targeting British soldiers in general, and then uh, there was uh, an operation that targeted a uh, contractor helping um, the uh, Iraqi government who was uh, kidnapped. There was a plot that was discovered. Uh, it's unclear if it was notional or if it was in the works, but was disrupted to kidnap British soldiers as they went to the toilet. Um, there were similar um, plots that were in the works and in, in the Karbala Provincial Center uh, one that was carried out targeting U.S. forces, where uh, Ali Musa Dakduka Musawi, one of the most senior Hezbollah operatives ever captured anywhere, was captured in southern Iraq, ultimately uh, released uh, by the Iraqi government and is now back uh, out there operating. But he was very involved in operations targeting both the United States, uh, U.S. soldiers and, and U.K. soldiers. Uh, but we've had other cases, including cases of um, 
Hezbollah operatives uh, with uh, with British citizenship. Uh, someone like uh, Mohammed Amar, a Hezbollah operative with UK citizenship who was arrested in Florida on narcotics money laundering charges. Uh, according to investigators, Amar is known for facilitating the laundering of illicit funds through Holland, Spain, the UK, Australia, Africa. You get a sense of the global reach of a group like this. And it's not the first and won't be the last time that there are operatives working for Hezbollah with British, for that matter, U.S. or other citizenship. Perhaps what's been most surprising over the past few years is the uh, number of uh, Hezbollah operatives with Swedish citizenship. And so this is something that has people's uh, attention really uh, around the world. Just just honing in a little bit on what's been going on in the Syrian civil war, I mean, there has been some focus um, on, on the detail of exactly what Hezbollah has been doing in terms of just how bad some of their activities have been. I mean, I, there, there is this debate that on the one hand, you know, Hezbollah has had really extensive uh, uh, combat experience in Syria, um, that they have grown uh, uh, from a sort of organization into into a sort of well-trained, well-experienced army. But there's also been some reporting that Hezbollah has been involved in probably some of the worst atrocities that have been committed in the Syrian civil war. I mean, I'd say that's something we certainly need to look into much uh, more carefully. I've, I've heard a lot of these reports, and they make a lot of sense given where Hezbollah has been fighting when some of these uh, atrocities have been carried out. Uh, it's very difficult to know exactly for sure who's carrying out what, uh, but we do know that some of these um, uh, entities have been uh, under Hezbollah command. Uh, and in general, we see Hezbollah as uh, the most capable fighting force that came to the uh, rescue of the Assad regime at a time already when it was clear that the Assad regime had killed exponentially more people, women and children, primarily civilians, uh, than the Islamic State all told, exponentially more. And while the international community has, for very good reason, gotten uh, very focused on the Islamic State, it somehow uh, hasn't had the same sense of urgency about uh, a dictator who has used chemical weapons and starvation as a tactic of war, um, targeting and killing far more people than the Islamic State has all told. And Hezbollah has been uh, at the tip of that spear on behalf of the Assad regime, together with uh, Iranian uh, foot soldiers and a large number of Iraqi Shia militias, many of whom are operating under Hezbollah command. Separately, we have the issues of Hezbollah building up its own uh, capability to produce uh, missiles and to make its existing uh, stockpile of um, missiles that don't have particularly good guidance systems into far more precision rockets, uh, both in Syria and perhaps uh, more disconcerting in Lebanon itself. And so you had the Israelis releasing uh, um, satellite imagery of uh, three such facilities believed to be buried uh, underground in Shia Hezbollah controlled areas of, of Beirut. The Lebanese government then took uh, diplomats on a tour of two of the three of these facilities, not all of them, and none of them did it take people below ground where the facilities are believed to be located, one right near a mosque, one under a soccer stadium, one by the port. Nor is it the first time that Hezbollah has placed or hidden um, weapons or other military facilities in the heart of residential areas, which in effect in violation of international law is using human shields. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to talk about that in some more detail. I noticed you you wrote, you wrote an article about this recently. I mean, are we talking about storage facilities? It's not entirely clear. It seems that what we are talking about in this most recent case is a place where rockets that Hezbollah already has will be uh, brought to and where special machinery will be located to add kits to the rockets that will give them uh, some GPS uh, precision, precision guidance um, that would make them far more uh, deadly weapons. Um, and if the 2006 war uh, was any indication that Hezbollah would use at least some of them for targeting of civilian uh, populations in Israeli population centers. 
Um, there are other facilities that appear to be weapons production facilities to produce some of their own rockets. Um, and they have storage facilities. This is not new uh, throughout Lebanon. Obviously, uh, they need to store their weapons someplace. They're not going to store those out in the open. They're illicit weapons in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Um, they are not the weapons of the Lebanese state of the Lebanese Armed Forces. And these are held in facilities uh, across Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that, uh, that there'll be a lot of focus. But, but finally, I just wanted to ask a question about what your view was of the UK decision. I mean, do you see this, um, if the UK does announce they're banning all of Hezbollah, do you see this as just sort of the fiction of the two wings was just, you know, enough was enough. It just was clearly uh, didn't really stand up to scrutiny. Or did you think there was perhaps some new intelligence and some new analysis? Well, this is something that's come up periodically within the UK, especially uh, when there have been Kuds Day uh, rally, rallies uh, in in London with people coming out, waving Hezbollah flags openly and people trying to figure out where does the, where do you draw the line in a partial prescription when you're dealing with a flag, for example, that uh, features a weapon um, and is clearly about something militant. Um, and uh, I most recently wrote a couple of articles about this in, in January when this came out in that context. It's a conversation I've been having with British officials for quite some time now. Uh, and there seems to have been uh, an increase in awareness over time about the extent to which Hezbollah is engaged in activities in Europe, the extent to which Hezbollah is engaged in activities in the UK, including uh, through its foreign relations department, which increasingly is engaged in logistical and operational activities as well. And then also the extent to which Hezbollah is simply engaged in militant and terrorist activities around the world that are in stark opposition to British values uh, and British policies. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, prescription issues continue, uh, assuming Brexit uh, uh, happens. But under the EU's um, CP931, Common Position 931, the European Union's designation authority, uh, European countries and the European Union itself do not need to base a designation only or even at all on activities of a group in their particular country or in Europe. It's sufficient, for example, to say, look at the terrorist activities that Hezbollah is engaged in around the world, uh, and that is something that warrants prescription. Um, again, as more cases have come out of individuals with British citizenship acting on behalf of Hezbollah as Hezbollah operatives, and that's not unique to the UK, we've had uh, Americans and Swedes and Frenchmen and Australians and Canadians all over the past few years. Um, uh, I think that there has been a shift in attitude. And then I think also there's there's uh, an increase in awareness as this whole debate over anti-Semitism has really come to the fore in the UK um, in kind of uh, at least partially a partisan way. It also has a very nonpartisan um, implication. And that's forced people to take a real, I think, hard look at some of these groups that, aside from their militant and terrorist activity, are expressly anti-Semitic by any definition. Uh, and I think that's probably had uh, a part of this conversation as well. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. We, we covered a lot of ground there. I really appreciate it. pleasure. That. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Uh, thank you for being with us this week.